What a blessed Sabbath to each one out there. It's a good day to be here, isn't it, today? God has been merciful and gracious, and I tell you what, we are truly living on the brink. We're living on the edge, and the sealing process has begun, and we are in a very fearful time, I tell you. Now, last week we had the first two portions of this series on the sealing, and we looked at an introduction to the concept of the sealing, and the sealing of God's people sets in contradistinction to the mark of the beast that actually shows who are Satan's people. God's going to have his people, Satan is going to have his people. And this concept of the sealing is a concept that is spoken of a lot in Adventism. We read about the sealing in the spirit of prophecy a lot. But there's a portion of it that is some, and I say somewhat neglected, at least neglected by many, and that is a, 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 a prophecy in the book of Ezekiel that speaks about the people receiving the seal of God and also speaks about a certain people that don't receive the seal of God. And this is based, in, according to the book of Ezekiel, upon those who sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the church. In Ezekiel chapter 8, there are four abominations that are spoken of, and we'll get to them in just a minute. But it says that those who sigh and cry about these things receive the seal of God. And those who don't, they are struck down by the destroying angel. It's clear that they will be the ones who receive the mark of the beast. Now, there is in volume 5 of the Testimonies, the Testimonies of the Church, volume 5, um, page 207, there is a chapter entitled The Seal of God. And there it is in my volume, you can see there. And I was talking to someone recently, and they said, you know, I've never read the testimonies through. You think I should? <laughs> what do you think I said? <laughs> yes, you absolutely should. And I say that right here is a very good place to begin. Don't miss this chapter. Of all the chapters in the testimonies, I think it's probably the most important chapter for us living at this time. So I would encourage you to, to do that. In Ezekiel chapter 8, he speaks there of four abominations. And the Hebrew word we learned for abomination is tuva, tuva, And it means something that is disgusting, something that is abhorrent, something that is loathsome. I mean, think of what really just turns you off, like maybe a cockroach running across your plate, or a fly landing on your sandwich, you know, or, or maybe seeing a child abused. Those would be loathsome things to us, wouldn't they? We would say those are abominations. The first of those abominations that were listed is called the image of jealousy. And in the second part of this, this series, we looked at that. And if you haven't seen the first and second part of the series, you really need to see them before you can see the third and fourth part. They'll be a lot harder to grasp and understand if you don't. But we, we, we studied and we found that this image of jealousy is a sun, a sun pillar, a sun pillar, like this sun pillar at the Vatican called the Obelisk of Heliopolis. And that these sun pillars are actually continued over into many of the uh, so-called professed Christian church world as church steeples. That's what a church steeple is. We found that as we read through and we looked at all these just quickly, we didn't discuss them, but we noted in Ezekiel 8 that it spoke there about images portrayed or carved upon the walls. We noticed also that women were weeping for Tammuz and also that the leaders had their backs to the sanctuary, their faces toward the east, worshiping the sun. So these were the four abominations that... Ezekiel spoke of. Now, what I'm preaching on today, I've actually written a good bit upon this earlier in detail, and we're only getting some of this today. I don't have time to go into all the detail in the time that we would have allotted here, but I'll give you some references. And if you'd like to get these references, just download the slides. We'll make them available at the end of this presentation, but you can also get them at Smyrna.org. If you go to Smyrna.org, go to Resources, Old Paths, uh, go to Smyrna.org, go to uh, Resources and Old Paths, and then to the Archives. And in the Archives, you find in the February of 2010 through the June of 2010, these issues. And, and they're the first two, and here are the next two 
there, um, and then finally the, the June issue. So that's where you can get the details, the details. For those who like to read and study, which is better than video, I promise you, it's always better than video. But today we want to talk about two of these abominations. We're going to be actually looking at the last two, the women weeping for Tammuz, and then we're going to be looking at the uh, turning of the backs to the sanctuary and the east toward the, the facing the east toward worshiping the sun, but starting with the weeping for Tammuz. And this is found in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14, and we'll begin by reading those verses. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now he says, you're going to see greater abominations. I've skipped over the second abomination. We're going to be looking at it this afternoon. I'll explain why I did. But one thing, I'll just give you a preview on that. It speaks there about wicked, a wicked abomination. Something that is done that is a wicked abomination. And so whatever that was, he says, this is even greater. Now, who is Tammuz? How do we know anything about Tammuz? Well, this is the only place in the Bible where this individual that is called Tammuz is mentioned. But there is enough in history and in certain amount of folk folklore to put together about Tammuz and the history about Tammuz to come up with some things that we can be pretty sure about. And the story actually begins with Nimrod, the mighty hunter that we read about in Genesis chapter 10. Remember Nimrod founded what? Babel. Babel. And he took to wife a woman that we know whose name was Semiramis. Semiramis. Now, after a time, Nimrod died, and it was said that he went to the sun and became the sun god. After his death, his wife, Semiramis, became pregnant by an unknown lover and gave birth to a son who was named Tammuz. Now, even in those days, in that wicked society, being pregnant out of wedlock was not considered the right thing. And so Semiramis had to find some kind of a story or an excuse for why she was pregnant and had a child after her husband had died. And so she called together the scribes of Babylon and she declared that Nimrod, through the rays of the sun, had divinely, immaculately, if you please, impregnated her. Since her child would be born, the son of the sun god, the child would be divine, and she by proxy would become the mother of God. Tammuz, also known as Adonias, meaning Lord, was born on the day that we call December the 25th. Do you see any parallels beginning here? Do you see Satan with a master plan to try to produce an imitation of Christ? Now, like his supposed father Nimrod, Tammuz was reputed to have been a great hunter. One day he was on a hunt and he was killed by a wild boar. Some legends said that he resurrected himself on the third day, but one thing we know for certain is that they had 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. And this is the parallel where Catholicism today has 40 days of Lent. Ash Wednesday, hot cross buns, and we'll mention that in just a minute. But I want, to, I want to take you to Romans now. We're just going to take a little pause, and it really isn't a true pause, but we're just going to take a slight detour here to the book of Romans, the first chapter here, because I want you to notice what Paul says, what happens when we fail to worship the true God. Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to start in verse 18. Romans 1, verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. One translation says, who hold back the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shewed it unto them. Verse 20. 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in, became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Continuing to verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto a corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Keep those terms in mind. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forevermore. Amen. Now let me just pause before we read a little bit more here. God says that they are to worship the Creator of all things. This was His plan, that as Creator, He was to be worshipped. But you can see that Paul is, is expressing here that they started to worship the creature rather than the Creator. And they even started to represent the Creator, he says, like incorruptible like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and even what? Creeping, Creeping things. Isn't that interesting? You'll, you'll see that later. You'll see that come up later in our next study. And it says they changed the truth of God into a lie. Just like in the time of Samarimus, and they're worshiping the sun instead of worshiping the one who made the sun. Verse 26 now. For this cause, we might say because of this, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemingly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was met. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to, those, to do those things which are not convenient. I don't know if you begin to realize it, but we are in a crisis in this country. We're in a crisis over this sexual identity and these concepts of gender and, and sex and what constitutes a man, what constitutes a woman. God says that the woman is not to be with a woman. That is not natural. People will say, I was just made this way. This is the way I am. And that's not true, friends. That's not true at all. It says the man would burn for the man unlike and, and, and go against nature and the God of nature. And so we see that when we start to worship a false God, friends, when we start to worship the creature rather than the creator, it leads to all kinds of deviant, activities and lifestyles. When one leaves the worship of the true God, there really is nothing else to worship but the creature. Now interestingly, the sign of Tammuz was a wooden cross. A wooden cross. And this is why we have the hot cross buns in Catholicism for Tammuz. But there's an interesting text in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. Notice what Moses had told those people. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that the land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. He says that criminals that were worthy of death were to be hung upon a tree. But their bodies were not to be left upon the tree. They were to be taken down at night so that the land would not be defiled. Now, you may remember that the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 5 and verse 30 said that the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, he said, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. He says that the crucifixion was the equivalent of being hanged on a tree. Now, did the body of Jesus remain upon the cross? 
No, it didn't upon that tree. It didn't stay there the, that whole day or, and, and even into the night. No. You see, Satan wanted to convince the people based upon this text that Jesus was a criminal and he certainly deserved to die because this is what you do with criminals. You hang them on the tree, but you don't let them stay on the tree all, all night. The rabbis could point to this prophecy and they could say, Jesus is a fraud. He died upon a tree and he was taken down. But friends, of course, Jesus Christ is no sinner. He was not a sinner who should have been condemned, but he did die in our place upon that tree where we should have been. And Paul speaks of this in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. He says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, and he's going to quote now from Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Here Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy, and he takes the argument and he reverses it, if you please, showing that it was necessary for Jesus to die on the cross because he was taking our place. We were the sinners. We were the criminals who sinned and were worthy to die. And Jesus, hanging on the cross, he took our place. And this instrument of torture became the one thing that Paul said that he could glory of. And again, the sign of Tammuz was a wooden cross, but it is the real cross of Christ and what Jesus did there that is our glory. And that's why Paul could say, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, what is the bottom line of all this concerning this weeping for Tammuz? Tammuz represents in this prophecy a false Christ. A false Christ. And Ezekiel 8, 13 and 14 is a prophecy of a doctrine of a false Christ coming into Adventism. Now there might be some people say, well, that might be speaking about this Jesus of the Incarnation that took upon himself the sinless nature of Adam before the fall instead of the sinful nature. But friends, the that, that really has no connection to Tammuz like the doctrine of the Trinity does. The doctrine of the Trinity is an exact parallel to Tammuz being the son of the sun god, the son of the great god. The importance of this issue as we read in Ezekiel 8 and 9 becomes evident. Again, in chapter 8, God is calling this weeping an abomination and beloved, if God calls this false Christ an abomination, if he calls this doctrine of the Trinity an abomination, the worship of a false Christ, then it certainly is. And if we are in harmony and in tune with God, we will also consider it an abomination. It's just not something we can choose to do or choose not to do, and God will accept our worship either way. God says only those who sigh and cry for these abominations will receive his seal. If I'm sitting back and saying, well, you know, I believe the truth about God, but I'm worshiping in a Trinitarian church and I'm singing those songs with him, but I'm not speaking up, I'm not saying anything, I'm not protesting this, I'm not getting the seal of God either, friends. It's just that true. And you, you can argue with me all you want. That's fine. But don't argue with the Word of God because that's what God says. And that's the only thing that is important. Only those who sigh and cry about these wicked things will receive the pure mark of truth, the seal of the living God. We are talking about something that is essential if we're going to be a part of the 144,000. Amen? Those are the people who will be sealed just before probation closes. Those who have a zeal for the honor and glory of God, friends, will not wish to be involved in anything that is disgusting to God. And if you wish to be a part of the 144,000, you will have to put God first and honor God first in all things. Now again, you may not be worshiping Tammuz today, but do you sit in silence when Tammuz is presented? If you do, you will not receive the seal of God. That's plain and clear. Friends, I would rather be 
considered like Elijah, a troubler of Israel, than to be someone who says nothing. And I cannot and will not suppress the truth because it is unpopular. Will you? Now, we've just looked at an outline of this. Again, if you want the whole study, go back to the old past paper. There's a lot there on it. But we need to talk also this morning while we have a few minutes to look at this last abomination where the sanctuary is denied and Sunday worship begins. And that's found in Ezekiel chapter 8, starting in verse 15 now. Ezekiel 8, verses 15 through 18, but we'll read the first two verses here first. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. It's progressively getting worse, he says. Verse 16, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Where at? The inner court of the Lord's house. Jehovah's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, or Jehovah, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Here's the picture, friends. It is the leadership of the church who had their backs toward the sanctuary. Now, if you remember the orientation of the sanctuary, as you approached the, 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 the veil to come into the sanctuary, what direction were you facing? West. The sun would rise in the east. You would have your back to the sun as you would come into worship. But now we see the situation reversed. And it's the leaders. And now they've had their face, faces toward the east, worshiping the sun. Continuing in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, while I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, Though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. It's not just simply the leaders that are involved. He says the house of Judah. They have led the whole people into this apostasy with them. Now there are two main points, again, about this apostasy spoken of in these verses. Firstly, the professed leaders of God's people had their backs to the temple. And secondly, they are facing the east, worshiping the sun toward the east. Now, what could be the significance of having our backs toward the sanctuary? Well, let me just remind you of this. In the book, Great Controversy, on page 409, in paragraph 1, it says, The scripture, which above all others had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith, was the declaration under 2000, and 300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What is the central pillar of Adventism, friends? It's the sanctuary message. We know that according to the testimony of Jesus, there, there are, are pillars, what she calls pillars of our faith. Proverbs says, Thou hast hewed out the seven pillars. There are seven pillars of our faith. But the central one is the sanctuary doctrine. And we are a people of the atonement and people of the final atonement. Now, this morning, I don't have time to, to go through a study of the atonement to show you what we had taught according to the Bible and what is being taught today. But this teaching, this teaching that God gave to our people has been repudiated, friends, by the mainline Adventist leaders. Starting 65 years ago with the publication of Questions on Doctrine, and it's just been snowballing forward ever since. And again, if you'd like to have the documentation on this, see the May issue, May 2010 issue of Opaz about our sanctuary message and the tearing down of it. But I assure you, it is documented, well documented. My question is to you, how does God view something like this? How does God view when we turn our backs on him, what he's trying to do for us and his message? Well, God has given us 
he has given us some illustrations to help us. In volume A, the testimonies, and again, you know, do I really need to read the testimonies? <laughs> There's a testimony in volume eight, and it's entitled, Shall We Be Found Wanting? Shall We Be Found Wanting? I would encourage each one of you, it's a short testimony, it's only seven or eight pages, read that testimony. She says this, In the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist Church might be weighed. Oh, it doesn't say that, does it? It says, in the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to be weighed. In other words, there's going to be a corporate judgment for Adventism. You see, there's these people who think, well, you know, Adventism is, well, we're Laodicea. We're the Seventh Church. There is no other church. Laodicea is going to go through no matter what they do. They can continue to reject Christ. They can accept a false Christ. But it's going to go through. But she says that there is a weighing out or a judgment for the church. And then she explains how she'll be judged. She continues. She will be judged. She will be judged. How? By the privileges and advantages that she has had. If her spiritual experience does not correspond to the advantages that Christ at infinite cost has bestowed on her, if the blessings conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her, on her will be pronounced the sentence found wanting. By the light bestowed, the opportunities given, will she be judged. That's volume 8, page 247 in paragraph 2. Who has had, I ask you honestly, sincerely, openly, who has had the blessings, the opportunities, the advantages that have been given to Adventism? No people on this earth ever. But this tells me that we're going to be judged by those advantages. You know, when a child is young and, and, and they do something wrong, we don't condemn that child when they don't understand what they did or they haven't been taught yet. I remember when my little boy Hans was just, just learning to speak. And he had a trouble sometimes rounding out certain words. And he tried to say one word and it came out sounding just like another word that you wouldn't want him to say, you know. We didn't take him, pick him up and spank him and say, you bad guy, right? But if when he was a teenager he had said that word clearly, there had been a woodshed incident, right? You get me? Well, what about us as a people? We've had great light, great length. Notice the language employed, the church, the corporate body. She is to be weighed. She will be judged by the privileges and advantages that she has had. And again, I tell you that no people have ever had the light that God has been pleased to give this people. And yet we are told that if the blessings conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted on to her, on her will be pronounced the sentence found wanting. Now there's another statement that Ellen White makes about treason. Treason. And may I remind you again, as I've told you before, treason is the worst of all crimes. Treason is the one crime that has capital punishment in it. And the reason is because when you, when you commit treason, you endanger not just one or two people, you endanger a whole nation. This is in Desire of Ages on page 716 in paragraph 1. The history of Judas. Remember Judas, that good guy? The one that everybody looked up to, the one that they thought was probably the leading apostle for a long time? The one that people just loved? The history of Judas presents the sad ending of a life that might have been honored of God. Had Judas died before his last journey to Jerusalem, he would have been regarded as a man worthy of a place among the twelve, and one who would be greatly missed. The abhorrence which has followed him through the centuries would not have existed but for the attributes revealed at the close of his history. But it was for a purpose that his character was laid open to the world. It was to be a warning to all who, like him, should betray sacred trust. Did you get that? There will be those who would betray sacred trust. And Judas and his demise was to be 
an illustration, an example to those who would betray sacred trust. Having a false God, having a Tammuz, if you please, that we weep for, leads to the worship on a false Sabbath. We all know what the fourth commandment states. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. We know this. It tells us to rest the seventh day as a memorial of God's creative ability. And it is a sign of his saving and sanctifying power, as we saw in the beginning of our study on the ceiling. But now I want to share with you a statement. This is from the Catholic writer Henry Tuberville. It's from An Abridgment of Christian Doctrine with Proofs of Scripture for Points Controverted, page 211. And he's speaking of Sunday here. And he says, it, that is Sunday, is a day dedicated by the apostles to the honor of the most holy Trinity. And in memory that Christ also rose from the dead upon Sunday, sent down the Holy Ghost on a Sunday and all, and therefore is called our Lord's Day. It is also called Sunday from the old Roman denomination of Deus Solus, the day of the sun, to which it was sacred. Now, friends, of course, there is no scripture that tells us of any such uh, honor to Sunday or supposed trinity. There's no scripture saying that the apostles uh, decreed that uh, Sunday would be a day dedicated to the trinity. But this is the way Catholicism and much of the Christian, professed Christian world views Sunday. It's a day dedicated to the Trinity. The final events of the Mark of the Beast, friends, will not be isolated to the issue of Sunday alone. Along with Sunday comes the worship of the Trinity. And it will be said in that time that since all Christians, or at least almost all, universally worship the same God, that is the Trinity, they should all worship the Trinity on the day dedicated to the Trinity. That's Sunday. Beloved, this is not simply an issue of worshiping the same God on a different day, but rather the worship of a different God altogether. We have turned our backs to the sanctuary, and to the sanctuary message, the message of the final atonement. The backs of these people have been turned to the, to the true plan of salvation, which teaches righteousness by faith and the acceptance of the rest of Christ, illustrated through the Sabbath, to that which is the work of man, the works of man's hands, including Sunday worship and the mark of the beast. When the sanctuary message was given, light on the commandments was given as well. And these were all interlocking truths. You can't disturb one without disturbing the others. And this is why, after the truth about God was disturbed in Adventism, the sanctuary message was also altered. And also shows why the strength of the Sabbath commandment has been weakened, resulting, for example, in many Adventist churches having Easter sunrise services and, in fact, other Sunday services that are now entering into many of the Adventist churches, just as it happened in ancient times. We see a lowering of the standard of how we keep the Sabbath. There's hardly any choice for these people, friends, because they've left the true God. They don't have anywhere else to go. They have no anchor that will hold them. And the result is not only apostasy, the result is ultimate apostasy. Ultimate apostasy. Or leaving of the truth of God and the day that commemorates His creation and redemption to worship the creature, even Satan. Now, friends, God, obviously, through the prophet Ezekiel, through this, what we called an enacted prophecy, a prophecy that was shown, where Ezekiel was being shown literal events happening in Jerusalem in his time that would be prophetic of what would happen at the end of time. God obviously was not taken by surprise. He knew this a long time ago because he knows all. He foresees the future. God is, in a sense, timeless. But in the last days especially, he has, through his prophet, given to us special understanding. He's shown us Satan's battle plan against the remnant people. And Ellen White wrote straight warnings. Now, what I'm going to read to you comes from Selected Messages, Book 1, page 204, paragraph 1. 
It originally was published in some of the Series B number two articles, but I'm t using this reference simply because it's more accessible for more people easily. Selected Messages, book number one, page 204, paragraph one. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization were this reformation to take place, what would result? Now, before I go on, let me just pause here for a minute. Satan is urging, it says, the Advent people to, to, to make a reformation, to, to change things, that there would be a great reformation. When the book Questions on Doctrine was first published in 1957, Glenn Ford testified to me, Brother Ford, who's now resting, waiting on the Lord Jesus, he said, I was in a church in South Charleston, South Carolina, and one of the men went up to the, to the pulpit and said, you know, we've got some news. We have some great news. This is some of the greatest news that ever happened to our church. He said, we've had some meetings with some leading evangelical people, and they're now going to call us a Christian church. Oh, this is going to be a great reformation, a great thing for Seventh-day Adventists now. Well, he didn't know anything about it. He didn't know what was going on. Wouldn't you think, well, that'd be great. Wouldn't that be wonderful? People really now know that we're Christians. But what would be the result of this? It would be consistent in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Doctrines like the sanctuary doctrine. Continuing. She says, where this reformation take place, what would be the result? Here she goes. The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to our remnant church would be discarded. Let me just pause. Discarded. Not, just not always just changed, but even some discarded. Do you realize, friends, that you can be a member in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, mainline denominational church today, and you don't have to believe anything about the papacy. You don't have to believe anything about the mark of the beast. Do you know why? Because there is no fundamental belief in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today on the man of sin, the papacy, or the mark of the beast. But when Ellen White wrote this, there sure was. We said the man of sin is the papacy. And we spoke about the reformatory work of the third angel's message and the whole world being deceived by this Sunday stuff. But that's no longer in our fundamentals. They have been discarded. Our religion would be changed. Well, I'm going to tell you, you change the doctrines, you're surely changing the religion. That's a fact. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. Oh, it seems great. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly re regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. But God being removed. But God being removed. But God being removed. They would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be, would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. And friends, every bit of this prophecy has been fulfilled except the very last uh, statement. It's the only one that hasn't been fulfilled yet. But it's going to happen too. According to, according to the Lord, this is going to happen. Now, only those who are not involved in these abominations, who are not involved in this apostasy, and those who sigh and cry against them will receive the seal of the living God. And that's why I bring this up to you today. If, if we are not going to stand for the truth about God, if we're not going to stand for the Sabbath, friends, we're not going to get the seal of God. God has said enough about this in the Bible and in the testimonies so that we need not be deceived or taken unawares. So if God has given us light, we're to do what? Walk as children of the light. We're to walk in the light. Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. He said, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. 
But he says, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Friends, has God entrusted you individually with the truth? If God has entrusted you with the truth, he expects you to keep that truth. Writing to Timothy again in his last epistle, 2 Timothy 3, verse 14, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Oh, friends, I like that, don't you? I like that. Ellen White insightfully wrote the following, which I believe parallels in concept the statements of Paul to Timothy. She said in Life Sketches 196.2, We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teachings in our past history. Life Sketches 196.2. She says that there's two points that we need not and must not forget. The Lord's leading, yes, looking at what He has done for us as a people, but also His teachings in our past history. Friends, if we remember and cherish these, we need not fear any, anything. But there's an implication. And the implication is that if we don't remember these things, we will indeed have much to fear. Beloved, the main line, corporate church has officially left the true sanctuary doctrine for an evangelical mess of pottage. We've turned our backs to the sanctuary, and when this happens, the only thing that can be next is to turn to the sun and to sun worship. This is only reasonable since Sunday is the day dedicated to the Trinity. And again, it's no wonder that we see these sunrise services in Adventist churches during Easter. And of course, the church officials and pastors don't claim that they're worshiping the sun. They claim that they are worshiping the sun, S-O-N, and not the sun, S-U-N. But that's exactly what the evangelical churches say too, don't they? That's right. I think of what Joshua said as they were getting ready to divide the land up and have Canaan. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. What about you? Because, friends, again, the whole issue of the seal of God and the mark of the beast, it all comes down here. And the seal of God is going to be given to a group of people who have truly experienced and understand true righteousness by faith. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Faith that trusts explicitly in Christ. I don't usually tell too many dreams, but I had a dream last night. And in this dream, I was talking with three other people. And I was trying to share with them the message of, of, the, of the seal of God and, 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 and the truth of the Sabbath and obedience to the commandments of God and trusting in Jesus for everything. And, and, and at first, one of the people got it. He said, I, I get it. I see it. And then I made a statement in this, in this experience that really turned one of the people off. And they said, we don't need to keep the law because the law has been done away with. And I said, you just did away with grace. You just did away with grace. And then the second person said, I get it. You're exactly right. Because if there's no law, there's no need for grace anymore. And the other person said, I didn't say we don't need grace. I said, it's exactly what you said. And then in, in my dream, this person, I'm not saying it was inspired. I'm just saying, this is my dream. I'm just telling you the experience. But it, this person had that pallor look like, oh, I've just been found out. And I'm, I don't have any hope now. You know, friends, we can have hope because we know the truth. And the truth has a sanctifying influence. And you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And Jesus is that truth. We've been told that not many are going to receive the seal of God. She says, not even many among those who currently teach the Sabbath. That tells me, friends, that the statement of Jesus when he said, many are called but few are chosen, it helps me understand that in the end, when the going gets tough, we're going to find there's only a few who are tough. But those tough ones will get going. And they will do the work God has given to them. And the message will go. And for those who are willfully and, and wistfully looking toward heaven, they will find it. And they will find it right early. And I want to find it too.